You can never really pin a city down in time. Change is unstoppable. The city rises and falls in a never-ending cycle. Houses, buildings, whole blocks, and even entire neighborhoods disappear, and in a few generations, no one still alive can even remember them. South Bend is no different. It's seen many magnificent homes and buildings and outstanding architecture of all types and styles, many completely forgotten now. It's what we save and protect that says a lot about who we are and our city. On the national scene, except for a few homes of prominent Americans, little attention was paid to architectural history through the 19th century and up until the 1930s and 40s. In the 1930s, the Historic American Building Survey was undertaken. By the 1960s, almost 25% of the buildings surveyed had been altered or demolished. After the war, suburbs were built in ever-expanding circles around cities, and new roads and highways cut swaths through old neighborhoods. Federal tax policies gave deductions for any building taken down to build a new one. The importance of our architectural heritage and its continued loss finally was noticed by more and more people. The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 established the National Register of Historic Places. In 1976, Congress authorized the first tax incentives for historic preservation. Later legislation was passed to control urban renewal and highway construction. And most importantly, in 1954, the United States Supreme Court justices ruled in Berman v. Parker that cities could legislate historic districts. This was what cities needed to set up and maintain designated historic neighborhoods. Since the 1960s, South Bend has made steady progress in its awareness and appreciation of its historic legacy. It started with the national trend to rethink the values of the past plus a new appreciation of the craftsmanship and beauty of old buildings. At first, it was the economic benefits of building reuse that appealed to investors, plus the opportunity for individual homeowners to buy at bargain prices old homes to fix up. Gradually, the general public realized that there were many benefits to restoration and preservation of existing structures. An interest in South Bend history and our city's place in our country's growth and development inspired a new post-war generation. Consideration was given to our identity and the past lives and accomplishments of some of the prominent individuals who built the factories and had beautiful homes. City leaders were responsive to public interest in the reuse of still viable structures. With the establishment of the Historic Preservation Commission in 1974, Historic districts were set aside and established guidelines were set up for the maintenance and appearance of the houses within their boundaries. Tax and government benefits were initiated to help with the cost of bringing old houses back to life. Neighborhoods plagued with arson, abandonment, and negligence were no longer left to deteriorate so badly that they became streets of broken sidewalks and empty lots. By the 1980s, Victorian mansions were no longer called Victorian monstrosities. We realized that the individual characteristics of our city is our identity. What we have kept and preserved tells the story of our growth, expansion, and our ability to survive as the world changes. But before this, much of our valuable history was lost. Of course, we still build and plan. Progress sometimes means the loss of existing structures. Not all buildings can be or need to be saved, but every time something is considered for demolition, it should be judged not only for its architectural and historic value, but also the part it played in our lives. Empty lots and parking areas do not make a city. It has been estimated that in many cities, over one half of the historic structures removed have been lost to parking lots. Today, we try to think and plan before we act and have learned to listen to the input from the public. Buildings and homes still have to be taken down,
but the pride of our progress must be balanced with a respect for the story of our past. A field survey of 1828 plotting the new road from South Bend to Trail Creek near Lake Michigan mentioned the area near LaSalle's Portage as a beautiful place for a city. After LaSalle had negotiated a peaceful coexistence treaty with the local Miami Indians at the Council Oak in December 1679, the area was slow to develop, under French and British control for over 150 years. An agent for a fur company, Pierre Navarre, was the first white settler. He built a log cabin on the banks of the St. Joe River in 1820, married a Potawatomi woman, raised a family, and died in 1864. South Bend, first called South Hold, grew rapidly through the 1820s and 30s. By 1848, we connected to the national telegraph lines that ran through the country, and the first marriage license was issued in 1834. By then, we were officially called South Bend. An over 200-foot standpipe built for the city's water system was an ideal place to photograph the city as it grew after the Civil War. This church building, built in 1880 in downtown, can be seen in this view. Little else remains today in this photo from the 1880s. Known early on for its river-powered flour mills, by the late 19th century, South Bend was earning a reputation as a manufacturing hub for the region. Birdsoe was just one of six carriage makers in the city, and we now had a population of over 10,000. By 1880, the city's infrastructure was rapidly developing, and there were new bridges and parks throughout by 1900. The first paved streets appeared in 1865, South Bend grew by square miles every decade, with developers making fortunes on the thousands of new homes built. By the 1880s, most of the new neighborhoods were served by brick streets, and in 1898, the first asphalt was used. Some of South Bend's finest homes were built at this time. In the city of the late 19th century, buildings were ornate and streets were wide, Beautiful architectural detail and superior design and craftsmanship made South Bend the finest city in the region. There were hundreds of stores and shops downtown of every type for every need. The city had available architects, bankers, stationery stores, dentists, furniture dealers, harness makers, ice companies, lawyers, doctors, and sewing machine makers. Something for everyone, all downtown. The Lauber Metal Fabricating Building still exists from this period, now a restaurant. Most of the old banks are gone, but a few of the commercial buildings remain. South Bend's population and growth reached an astonishing level by the early 20th century. Fine school buildings were built by the dozens to serve the growing city, which by 1920 was now home to over 70,000 people. Visitors coming to town had many places to stay, with first-class accommodations found in the LaSalle and Hoffman hotels, both built in the late 1920s. These two fine buildings are still a prominent feature of downtown South Bend. Both have been recently converted to apartments, fully stored, and are helping to convince people once again of the many advantages and conveniences of living in the downtown area. Apartment buildings were scattered in and around town. One of the finest was the Mar Main, which remains to this day. South Bend, in 1930, could say with pride that three 10-story-plus buildings had been built in the last few years. All the streets and boulevards were four or more lanes wide, and population had reached over 100,000. There were no empty lots or parking lots to be seen in the whole center of the city. For many years, South Bend had a city trolley service with lines reaching all over to suburban areas. 
The first plane to fly over our town was in 1908, and by 1928, American Airlines initiated flights around the region from our new airport. During these years of rapid growth and through the 1950s and 60s, much of Old South Bend started to disappear. Some homes and factories and familiar stores fell into disrepair and one day were gone. The commercial heart of the city changed. Some old, once vital areas became shabby and once familiar businesses like old neighborhood gas stations became fewer and fewer. But the city remained healthy and continued to grow into the 1970s. Many of the streets had changed little since the 1930s. New businesses moved in to occupy ones that had left. South Bend was still the place that most people would shop. South Bend hit its peak population at this time with over 135,000 people living in its city limits, an area of about 40 square miles. A grand plan to completely rebuild almost the entire downtown area was implemented at this time. Almost the whole east side of the heart of town was demolished. Much of the proposed new construction did not materialize. To this day, remnants of the plan exist as enormous areas of parking lots. One of the few buildings built during this project was the new Century Center, which was completed in 1975. With determination and effort, South Bend has since this time corrected past mistakes with some new downtown buildings and improvements. Some new architecture in both traditional and modern styles, plus manufacturing and tech hubs like Ignition Park have come into existence since the 1990s. Today, South Bend is once again experiencing population growth and a renewed confidence in its capabilities to succeed and prosper in the future and regain its status and reputation as a great place to live and work. Many South Bend buildings have been lost to fire over the years. Many more demolished because they were thought to be no longer useful. Through the 1960s, there remained several department stores downtown that South Bend residents had shopped at for generations. Fondly remembered was the Kresge store on the corner of Michigan Street and Jefferson Boulevard. Built in the 1880s, it originally was a Studebaker administration office the only one left in the country. Famous for its lunch and soda counter, it was vacated in the early 1970s. The bank that owned it made no attempt to find any use for the building, and no one came forward that wanted it. The Historic Preservation Commission, newly formed in 1974, tried to save it. A study found it needed about $25,000 in repairs to make it up to city code. The bank decided it no longer wanted it, and in early 1975, it was demolished. Alt's Camera Store was located in this 1890s building from 1918 to 1973 when it relocated. The building burned and was demolished in 1975. The Philadelphia was a fine candy shop and restaurant. Built in 1901, it originally had both gas and electric lighting. It had tables and booths, candy displays, a soda fountain, and mirrored walls with a tile floor. Part of the city's redevelopment plan, it was demolished in 1974. The Lincoln Hotel was lost to redevelopment in the 1960s, as were some others, some plain, some quite impressive. The Redstone South Bend Public Library was replaced with a new building in 1958. This shopping area on Portage is now a vacant lot. Factories like South Bend Toy were vacant for years and finally removed as fire hazards. This little gas station 
located near the city cemetery, was closed for years. It remained empty and deteriorating until finally one day it disappeared. The old water company building was vacated by the city and was gone in the 1990s. South Bend's beautiful YWCA could have been made into a really nice apartment building, but no one was interested and it was demolished in 2008, replaced with a hospital loading dock. The corner of Michigan Street and Monroe Street was at one time home to several businesses and retail stores. Efforts were made to find reuse of the space. No definite plans materialized. Repairs were considered, but no funds were available, and no one came forward wanting the site. It is now a vacant lot. Sometimes areas of the city were lost because new ones were planned. Ignition Park, once the site of 80 acres of Studebaker factory land, was created in the 2010s. Rose Brick relocated, and its classic early 20th century grounds were used to build new medical facilities in the 1990s. Even familiar streets change. After 100 years as a four-lane street, Maine became two lanes. This was part of a two-year plan to reconfigure all the downtown streets and traffic patterns. At several key intersections in downtown, roundabouts were constructed and traffic signals removed. The Oliver Block was a superior townhouse development of the 1880s. The opportunity to preserve these fine residences was missed, as they were converted to a much simpler row of retail storefronts. The quality of architecture on South Bend business streets were a showplace of urban design that was not matched by any city in the region. The city is dotted in and around with many three- and four-story apartment buildings. Quite a few were built in the 1900 to 1930 era. This example, the Horatio Apartments, fell to fire in the 1980s. This corner is totally gone now. The buildings and traffic signals and the whole street were removed and the corner was redesigned as a gentle curve in the 2010s. The Jefferson Hotel was a classic 19th century design. Its solid appearance and fine detail work, including rows of large windows, were a real asset to the city. It could no longer be kept up as a hotel and no use was found for the structure. As a result, it was raised. The site was then a fast food restaurant, but now, happily, it is a location for a new five-story office building. Not so lucky was the six-story Sheraton Hotel built in the early 1960s. Even after millions were spent in the 1990s to renovate it and convert it to an office building, it was torn down to make a parking lot in 2006. Movie theaters in all cities have become a liability as large public spaces are difficult to heat and cool. The Colfax, closed by the 1980s, was gone by the 1990s. The Avon lingered on hoping for a reprieve, but it never came. After the usual search for someone interested in its reuse, it was finally demolished in 2012. Some elements of its facade were preserved. Leaper Park is South Bend's park along the St. Joseph River on the north side of town. Once a landing site for riverboats, it had been cleared for a park by 1900. It featured a wading pond for children with an area of sand and a pergola for shade. Nearby was the duck pond, Every South Bend resident for a hundred years had memories of stopping by and feeding the ducks. Even in the coldest part of the winter, a small part of the water stayed open for the ducks to swim in. It was extensively renovated in the early 2000s with new plumbing and a new duck shelter and top to bottom cleaning. Concerns were brought up about the health of the ducks and the bother of upkeep and after much discussion, it eventually was covered over and disappeared in 2019. The fate of some of the most spectacular, enormous, and grand examples of Victorian architecture was sealed by their close proximity to downtown. As long ago as World War I, many of these splendid homes already started to disappear. Most are totally forgotten today, and only proof of their existence is in the form of a few fading photographs. Commercial buildings were not considered worth keeping if progress got in their way. 
but it is hard to justify the demolition of the famed and beautiful Dental Palace. Today, it's the site of the city utilities office. The curved glass of the towers would be worth a small fortune if it could be made or purchased today. With one or two exceptions, almost all the houses presented here were not replaced. Most are now parking lots. Many of the parking spaces are for businesses that no longer exist. Much of the best architecture we were so fortunate to have in our city is now a flat area only three or four inches high. South Bend had, and still has, many fine stone church buildings. One of the best was on the northwest corner of Main and Wayne Streets, right across from the five-story YMCA and Caddy Corner to the old library. It was ideally positioned among other outstanding buildings. Now the site is a bar, which was once a bank, and the YMCA was gone by the late 1960s. Today, perhaps, these structures might be considered in a different light. The city is no longer growing at the explosive rate of 100 years ago. Maybe the city could have grown around them, and they could have remained in fine condition and still be lived in, but that almost never happened. You can't stop owners from tearing down a place if they want to, although we can protect the great architecture left in the city by giving it a historic designation, which is one of the pursuits of the Historic Preservation Commission. Also, whole neighborhoods since the 1970s have been given historical status and are monitored to ensure proper care of the houses and their boundaries. Yet even today, if a building does not have a historic designation or is not part of a protected neighborhood, the owner can do whatever they want with it. This large house was built in the 1920s and nothing could protect it. It was demolished in 2021 and is now an empty lot. South Bend had some very impressive school buildings, mostly built from 1890 to 1930. Architectural styles varied among them, each distinctive and different. They were very well built, thick brick walled, and trimmed exceptionally well. But with a shrinking school enrollment in the 70s and 80s, some were closed and the buildings were difficult to maintain. Some were replaced by simpler, more basic school structures that were bland and undistinguished, but had more modern electrical heating and plumbing features. It's unfortunate that they could not have been put to better use. These school buildings could possibly have been converted to apartments. This was successfully done with South Bend Central High School. Other uses are charter schools or private schools, our arts and exhibition spaces, like Colfax School has been since the 1990s. The Oliver Theater was built in 1885 and originally was four stories. It was added onto an early in its life and became eventually seven stories tall. It had a very ornate and richly decorated interior and was finally finished with velvet draperies, gilt carvings, and crystal chandeliers. It was famous for its almost perfect acoustics. It had elaborate stage devices and engineering. Like many great buildings the city has lost, it was built on a scale which could have been meant for a much larger city. After years of vacancy and no one wanting it, it was demolished in 1979. The site is now a small, mostly unused lot. The Oliver Hotel, built in 1898, was the finest hotel ever built in South Bend, and one of the best in the country. Famous for its full-service facilities and quality of its furnishings, it was built with the finest materials and was meant to be the centerpiece of the city. The interior furnishings were by Marshall Field & Company of Chicago. George Wheelock of South Bend provided the lighting fixtures, and the elevators were made by the Otis Company. The lobby was very impressive, with high domed ceilings. There were four murals painted around the lobby depicting the seasons. Available to guests off the lobby were a barber shop, a hairdressing parlor, valet services, taxi cab service, public stenographer, and a newsstand, plus a library room. Everything in the lobby was designed to impress visitors and was typical of the period. Wood trim, tiles, lighting, seating areas, and decorative touches were meant to create a lasting impression. The quality of the cuisine was excellent, and the hotel was famous for its dining room, said to be one of the most beautiful in the country. Many people stopped in for meals. 
The cafeteria was a popular place for the general public to meet. Over 500,000 people dined at the hotel on an average year in the 1920s, averaging 1,400 people a day. The public also used the hotel's facilities for dances, balls, luncheons, and club gatherings. All the comings and goings of the lobby could be viewed from the mezzanine which circled around it. In 1937, the Albert Pick Hotel chain spent over $100,000 for renovations and changed its name to the Pick Oliver in 1957. In the 1960s, the chain decided to replace it with a newer building. Local protest was strong, which helped create an awareness of historic preservation in the city. Sadly, the building could not be saved, and by 1970, a new hotel was erected in its place. The furnishings were sold at auction. The Four Season Mural sold for $300. The site is still occupied by a hotel today. The City Hall came from an era of very beautiful construction in South Bend. It was built in a Renaissance style in 1902 and had pressed yellow brick exterior, stone trim, red tile floor, Tennessee marble wainscoting, and white oak woodwork. The city relocated to a new office in 1970, and it was demolished, its attic still filled with city records which were destroyed. Many uses were suggested for the reuse of the site, which remains to this day a parking lot. Over the years, South Bend has lost some amazing buildings. One of the most wonderful of all was the white terracotta 10-story Oddfellows building. Built in 1930, it was a massive structure, costing over $20 million in today's money. It had retail shopping on the ground floor, and the rest was reserved for lodge use. There was a banquet hall, a library, kitchen, and reading rooms. Best of all, its top floor had a 22-foot high ceiling and a 360-degree view of downtown, a spectacular setting for an event. It was built by a South Bend company, and everything about its construction was first class. Lodge membership declined as time went by, and the city wanted to purchase the building and demolish it for a proposed mall development. The Historic Preservation Commission fought in an attempt to save it. But it was gone in 1980, the tallest building ever demolished in South Bend. Incredibly, it was only 50 years old. The mall was never built. The corner remained vacant until 1983, when a three-story bank was built on the site. The South Bend YMCA was built in 1908. Paid for and furnished by the Studebaker Corporation, it took two years to construct. It was estimated that in the 1920s, the yearly attendance was an astounding 600,000 people. It employed 43 people at that time in the cafeteria, plus maids, janitors, and secretaries. An almost equal size addition, the boys building, was added in 1913 a new, larger gym in 1916. The main building had 150 rooms, and the cafeteria served over 18,000 meals a month. This is another building that could have made nice apartments and could have been upgraded for much less cost than a new building. But attendance dwindled over the years, and in the early 1960s, the Y decided to move to a new, much smaller building away from downtown. In 1965, only 57 years old, the solid, beautiful old Y was demolished. The site is now a parking garage. It's hard to imagine today, but at one time, South Bend had its own amusement park. Playland Park was visited by thousands every year. It had a racetrack, a roller coaster, a pond with boats, a little train that ran around the grounds, a merry-go-round, a skating rink, and a maze of mirrors and more. It started out as Springbrook Park. In the 1880s, the Short Line Railroad from South Bend ran out to the corner of Ironwood and Lincoln Way East. People would ride out and picnic there. Soon, the railroad decided to put up a few rides for the summertime picnic crowd. The land eventually became privately owned. By the 1920s, it was a very popular destination with something for everyone. At this time, a contest was held to pick a new name for the park. 
The $50 prize was won by a little girl who suggested Playland as its new name, and an appropriate name it was. 5,000 children visited it on one day in 1951 for a Halloween event. Attendance was strong through the 1950s. Schools had holidays for the students there, and many were joined by their parents and spent the whole day enjoying the park. But times change. The park began to show its age by the late 1950s. Although still kept up, attendance started to decline. The city wanted to use the land for commercial purposes. The park was torn down and gone by 1959. A department store was built on a corner of the area. It became a car dealership, and it too is now gone. Finally, in the early 2000s, the area was developed into student housing for the adjacent Indiana University South Bend campus. All that remains of Playland, the happiest place in town, is the concrete grandstand seats on the north side of Lincoln Way East. Many people don't know what they are anymore or where they came from. Today, we still lose buildings for many different reasons. The Drury's Brewery was vacant for over 40 years, awaiting its fate until it deteriorated so badly it was finally torn down. The Medical Arts Building, a modern style office building still in good condition, was demolished by its owners to build an office on the site a classic example of a building being too large for its new purposes. The South Bend Brewing Association plant was torn down after years of discussion as to possible uses for it. The company had survived prohibition by selling ice and bottling pop and soda water. A few people came out to watch and take photos as the two-month-long demolition progressed. The large site on Lincoln Way West is now an empty lot, but it is hoped that it will be developed in the near future. Interestingly, the brewery's facilities aren't entirely gone, as the 1910 bottling plant remains and is occupied on the site's west side. Bendix Corporation, which once employed thousands as late as the 1950s, was mostly demolished recently. A tiny part was saved as an office by its current owners because it was just too large to use or maintain. This plant was enormous, covering many square blocks with acres of parking. It had developed and manufactured many electronic and mechanical systems for aviation, the military, and aerospace uses. It was one of the last of the old factories that helped make South Bend products known worldwide. We know that uh, South Bend has enjoyed a, a tremendous history and uh, even back in the, about a century ago uh, folks gathered around and wanted to proclaim South Bend as a, a world famed city. And so, uh, you know, until Studebaker closed uh, in the 60s, we were a top world class city and uh, that's something that uh, we're very proud of here in South Bend. And because of that, we have the structure, neighborhood structure, housing structure, and uh, street and other infrastructure that uh, allows us uh, to become a, a great city once again. It's a great time to be mayor of South Bend right now. When you're in decline, you have uh, infrastructure and things you can't uh, maintain because you've lost the folks to uh, you know, help pay for that. And so many difficult decisions were made uh, over the past several decades. Uh, but now we're in a great place where we're growing once again. Uh, we have resources that uh, we can put toward uh, preserving our historic special places, as well as uh, building on those areas where we unfortunately uh, had to tear down uh, some historic buildings that were gems, uh, but just fell into disrepair. Those cities who have uh, historic buildings and structures and neighborhoods and houses, uh, that shows that they've been a strong city uh, for a long time. We've been knocked down, but we've gotten back up and we've been able to preserve uh, many of our structures, many of our important special places. And that's important because we want to show the strength of South Bend as we move forward into this new century. In the early 1970s, much of the east side of downtown South Bend was removed. The destruction of so many quality buildings, plus fears that neighborhoods could also be cleared, 
regardless of their historic value, prompted the creation of the Historic Preservation Commission. They soon failed in their attempt to save the Kresge store, but were able to protect the 1855 courthouse, deteriorating since the 1960s. They were also able to guarantee it received proper care and maintenance. What is known as the Old Darden Road Bridge, also known as the Four Mile Bridge, was saved. Built in 1884, it originally was the LaSalle Street Bridge. Car traffic was banned on it in the early 1970s and it was totally repaired and restored as a footbridge. The Historic Preservation Commission of South Bend and St. Joseph County is an organization, an intergovernmental body uh, that serves to uh, advocate and select properties for preservation within the city of South Bend and unincorporated St. Joseph County. The Historic Preservation Commission is concerned with retaining historic structures. We have a number of mechanisms that we use to promote that preservation and to uh, ensure that preservation. We work closely with the building department for the issuing of building permits, a certificate of appropriateness, which is the document that says that proposed work on these historic structures is appropriate or allowed by the Historic Preservation Commission is needed before a building permit will be issued. We act as a sort of matchmaker to historic property owners to financial incentives that may be out there. So there are wonderful programs here in the state of Indiana. There's a residential historic rehabilitation tax credit that the state of Indiana administers for properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. For commercial income producing properties, there is a phenomenal grant through the Office of Community and Rural Affairs, which is a brick and mortar grant for up to $100,000 in project. Then there's the Historic Preservation Fund, which is sort of the uh, penultimate uh, historic preservation grant that is administered by the federal government through the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. So connecting property owners to those financial incentives and opportunities for help is one of the major things that we do. We're excited to be where we are today, where we're growing again and it's not a managing decline mindset, but it's a growth mindset. And we're able to put investments and bring both private investment and public investments uh, to make our city uh, thriving once again and make sure there's opportunity for everyone. We've made uh, you know, record investments in the last few years in our park system, uh, in neighborhoods that haven't been touched uh, in many decades. And so uh, there's a real liveliness in our city that we haven't had uh, in quite some time. So again, just an exciting time to be mayor of South Bend, to be in South Bend, and the future is bright. I often get asked, uh, how does historic preservation and our office and the commission benefit the community in economic ways? And uh, how is it a, a value add to the community? And we do that in a number of ways. One, historic preservation is often a very local economic driver. So the people who are doing historic preservation work, the contractors, tradespeople, skilled labor, they're very local. So you're immediately injecting, when you're paying for that labor, money into a local firm that is doing local work on a local project. The second aspect of that would be sustainability. Historic preservation is a very sustainable practice. It's taking an existing structure and investing in it for long term. Right now, new construction costs are skyrocketing, which means that investing in current and existing buildings is even more attractive as a financial investment. There are a lot of advantages to using ex existing buildings. Uh, first of all, it's a more sustainable way to uh, think about uh, our built environment, to adaptively reuse buildings that have been around for a long time. Older buildings have a lot of character to them. These are buildings that helped develop the look and feel of South Bend. And we really want to keep that historic character alive for future generations. The city values our historic properties, uh, especially downtown buildings and old offices, and we're always looking for ways to partner with the owners of those buildings or potential new owners as ways to redevelop those properties in a way that updates them uh, for today and into the future. Some of the advantages of the city for saving these historic properties is that it really speaks to how the city developed over time where we came from. It really reflects the story of South Bend, uh, the hard work and effort that generations have put into this community to bring us to today. And we really want to preserve that character 
into the future, as it is uh, the story of South Bend is often told with our historic architecture. Historic preservation locally, we assist that in creating landmark and uh, neighborhood tours for our historic districts and our historic scattered sites. We also give lectures and talks for the public or uh, for students, for schools. Uh, we give window workshops and uh, hands-on training workshops of how a homeowner or a property owner could do the preservation work themselves. Uh, I regularly joke, I'm a historian, and if I can do this work, you can too. Preservation, restoration, and reuse of our historic buildings has become a viable new business. Hardware, doors and windows, lighting fixtures, and architectural details are much sought after and even local construction companies have realized the potential of creating special divisions, staff foot preservation experts to get involved. Rehab and restoration are big business. It's getting to be even much bigger business as people are buying up more old houses and they're renovating them for safe places for their families to live. What are the advantages of using existing materials? Anything you can imagine from environmental sustainability to keeping building materials out of landfills. A lot of times people are reusing materials because it's personal to them. Maybe they had a parent or a grandparent who worked as a carpenter and the cultural heritage of their town is important. When taking on a restoration project, there's usually a bit of history that's involved. You look into the building's history, you might look into the history of the construction that's happened at the property. Most importantly, you investigate what the needs are of your restoration project. Historic preservation is very interdisciplinary. It requires all types of trades from carpentry to plumbing and electric. In addition to restoring components of the historic building, we also repurpose components that may have been salvaged from other places or even within the building itself. We've taken windows from one area and switched them to other areas, converting doors to windows, and we can take building materials that are salvaged from buildings that are being demolished and repurpose them throughout our construction projects. Historic districts and historic properties have special rules and regulations on how to rehabilitate those properties to protect them and preserve them. And this is where we can come in with specialists that are working with special tools and techniques that focus on restoration of existing building materials. And we also understand proper replacement materials when those materials are no longer viable. Why would people want to use existing building materials and why would people want to repurpose existing buildings? Some reasons for that would be that the building materials that are in the older buildings are a really good quality, come from old growth trees, and it's a hard to find those building materials here today. Also, health and safety within their homes. Um, a lot of times renovation of a home can help your family live more comfortably and in a safer environment once it's renovated. The Hibbard Building is a fine example of repair and reuse of a type of structure common in South Bend. One of the old and fine hotels in the city, the LaSalle, was gradually falling into disrepair. Used for various purposes, it eventually was vacant. Investors realized the tremendous potential of the imposing building and it was completely restored and is now a first-rate apartment building. A fire station was totally renovated and is now a fine restaurant, a real plus for the neighborhood. South Bend's train station on the old New York Central line was vacated when it was deemed too large to maintain. Coming dangerously close to demolition, a local investor purchased it and made it into an invent and digital technology center. Hopefully, someday it will be used as our new train station again as well. 
Many large homes are in the process of restoration and since the 1970s, several have been moved to new locations. A former armory, which had served several uses in life, was empty in recent years. Located on the river, it was a prime spot for development and is now a popular event center. The Michigan Street Bridge lights from 1914 were removed in the 1960s. Thought lost, a few were found and new ones made and installed. Leeper Park is the city's centerpiece park. One of its attractions was the Rose Garden, a remnant of its early days. By the 1990s, it was neglected and mostly forgotten. More recently, private individuals have carefully revitalized it, making it better than ever. In 2018, the garden and all of Leeper Park was flooded, but suffered only minor damage. Walker Fields Shelter is one of the many WPA projects that were built in the city in the 1930s. Morris Performing Arts Center was a movie theater built in 1922. It was typical of the scope and pride in the city's vision of itself a century ago, a truly magnificent construction. Summer concerts are held in the plaza it shares with the Palais Royal, a ballroom and events location that, like the Morris, was brought back from the edge of destruction. Styled after the palace at Versailles, it is a showpiece of tile, ceramic, and stone. It is the oldest, most authentically accurate depiction of the best life could offer in South Bend of the 1920s. Its ground floor is occupied by a restaurant and several businesses. Many commercial sites have been reused, including, on the city's heavily industrialized southwest side, several remaining Studebaker plants, as well as some small inner city stores. Several banks are awaiting new life, like this one on West Western, in a block of what was once a neighborhood retail shopping hub. Bars and specialty eating places are popular in South Bend, as the city attracts a new, younger population. Corby's and the Lauber Sheet Metal Shop are two, located on the near east side. Lauber's dates back to the 1890s, as was in business until the 21st century when it became a restaurant. Howard Park is South Bend's oldest. It was at one time a swampy area used as a city dump. T.S. Howard, a local judge, promoted the idea of turning it into a park. His efforts succeeded, and in 1894, it was named after him. At the northwestern corner, the Jefferson Street Bridge crosses the river into town. One of South Bend's most beautiful, it had reached a sad state by the 1990s. It was totally restored, rebuilt, the roadway was removed and repaired, plus the exterior concrete piers were recast. A little boy has a drink from a park fountain around 1915. Not too much changed through the years, except the original landscaping matured and the trees grew to full height. The concrete walk along the river was repaired and maintained well, although at times parts of it were flooded, as the area was only a few feet above the river level. In the 1990s, the park was home to the several-day-long South Bend Ethnic Festival and was visited by thousands. Damaged in a 2014 summer storm, the park got a total rehab in 2018-2020. The trees were removed and replanted, and concerts are now held on the new open stage area. The last vestiges of the past were gone when the 1958 park shelter and ice skating rink were removed. They were replaced by a much larger and better public area, including a restaurant and events rooms, plus a new playground and skating rink. Many quite new buildings have been upgraded. One is the former IBM building, which later became the home of the South Bend Community School Corporation. The Lafayette building, built in 1902 and added onto later, is a recent success story for preservationists. Its interior was in poor condition with a lot of water damage. A much needed new roof took care of the problem, and after interior repairs were completed, the entire building was sandblasted to like new condition. 
Now the building that was endangered for years can look forward to new uses in the future. Madison School was a new school built along Leeper Park in 1928. It was granted historic status just in time to save it in the 1970s. The Sherlin Building is one of the largest office sites in downtown. It had undergone several questionable attempts to modernize it, which included the removal of much of its architectural cohesiveness. In 2017, it was given back a bit of its old glory with a new restoration. The JMS building, built by John Studebaker, was South Bend's finest modern office building and largest when it was built in 1908. In white, shining terracotta at eight stories, it was also for a short time the tallest building in town. It was across the corner from the Oliver Hotel. Later converted to apartments and always well kept, it was given a complete interior and exterior renovation with accurate and painstaking repair of even the smallest details. This work, which was finished in 2017, included new exterior lighting. Once again, the 100-year-old building has become one of the highlights of downtown South Bend architecture. The Ward Bakery building from 1919 was vacant for decades. For years, attempts were made to find a use for it and it was endangered all this time. Finally, in 2021, the restoration process started with a new owner who is converting it into a small business center while preserving its classic exterior. All over South Bend and its neighborhoods are examples of commercial buildings and homes that have survived over the years. These are the lucky ones. Most of the city's bridges, the fine old homes built by wealthy business owners on neighborhood streets, have been overtaken by the growth and expansion of the city. Once first-rate retail stores and shopping areas that have faded away are left empty but still standing. There are still remnants of once enormous manufacturing complexes and the little machine shops and metal fabricators of the World War I era on South Bend's heavily industrialized South Side. Some of them have been continuously in use since they were built, some over a hundred years ago. Old streets go for miles past a variety of small stores and shops, interspersed with a few homes and don't look much different than they did in the 1950s. These surviving parts of South Bend, the commercial structures and quality old homes, offer a great opportunity for investors and preservationists. I think that in exploring our past, we develop an appreciation for what came before us and are more inclined to have the desire to save it. The picturesque architecture of the past in both buildings and houses is a part of the history and fabric of our neighborhoods and our community. When architecturally significant structures are destroyed, we lose a value that cannot be replicated. Yeah, I've worked on a number of historic homes over the years, including my own, trying to bring them back to where they were um, originally or even better. Um, and I think that helps the neighborhood, it elevates the neighborhood. The one we did, it was built 1960, and we sold it for so much more than what anybody else in the neighborhood had even thought because we'd done such a nice job. And that elevated the neighborhood and everybody was, was very pleased. Walking down certain streets in South Bend is like being in a museum. Many are still brick, and on them are some of the finest of South Bend's old homes. Even in the days when most people weren't interested in historic preservation, these were fortunately left untouched, and many were taken care of and given the respect they deserved. Although we have lost many fine school buildings, there are a few gems that have survived. Some are still used and therefore escaped demolition. Others have been converted for other purposes, such as neighborhood arts and performance spaces. 
Large hotels have been brought back to their former glory and made into apartments, and buildings that have remained apartments have been cleaned up, repaired, fitted with new mechanicals, and put back on the rental market for a whole new generation. Rows of commercial buildings and grand private and public halls and event spaces have continued to function through the years, little changed. Especially downtown, one can see a variety of survivors. On almost every block, there is a remnant of Old South Bend. Imposing banks, prominent on prime corners in the heart of the city, as well as three and four story structures with stores on the ground level and apartments on the floors above. An 1880s church, one of the oldest buildings in downtown, tells the story of that era. Large office buildings from the 1920s and 30s always occupied, and tiny ones with only two or three businesses inside coexist, seemingly untroubled and comfortable with the passing of time. Perhaps the finest building in downtown South Bend is the Tower Building. It was built in the three-year period of 1927 to 1930. During this time, the Oddfellows Building and the Hotel Hoffman were also constructed. The two city courthouses are noteworthy. The oldest is the 1855 structure on Lafayette Street. It gives one a real feeling of what South Bend's pre-Civil War era looked like. The 1898 building is said to have been inspired by the architecture of the legendary 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The buildings in South Bend that are survivors still exist for several reasons. Most importantly, they always had a purpose and were occupied. Being useful is a valuable trait. Some also had great aesthetic beauty and were obvious show places for the city that no one would want to lose, although this did not always protect them, as we have seen. Others were fortunate to be located in stable, unchanging neighborhoods and parts of the city. Too often population growth pushed outward from town and simply brushed aside older homes and stores. And finally, many were owned by companies or individuals who in the face of troubled times, like the Great Depression or periods of population loss, had the financial ability to keep them solvent and cared for. For these reasons, much remains of our architectural heritage. This accounts for many of the large and important buildings in town, but most of the homes built close to the city center were doomed as the city grew. An exception to this is the near west side where some great homes exist within a few blocks of downtown. They were simply jumped over as the city grew miles to the west. Today, these areas are a great place to take a walk and experience our old urban neighborhoods. As time goes by, South Bend's fine buildings of the past will be joined by much new quality construction of today. We must continue to value and protect both the old and the new. Commercial buildings and new homes are being constructed throughout town. Whole new neighborhood developments are being built and have contributed to population growth in the city. These new areas of homes and apartments will attract commercial business to serve the residents. As we continue to progress, we need to maintain this new construction as well. Already, the cityscape of the 1980s and 90s is approaching an age when it will soon need protection. South Bend has in the past few years made much cohesive progress in its utilization of vacant spaces in town. Individual houses are built where others once were and new apartment housing is now appearing on long neglected lots close to downtown. The city is attempting to close the gap and keep homes and businesses close to each other. 
This promotes an environment that enables residents to be able to log to visit neighbors and stores without having to drive. I get asked often about how we will engage with the next generation of historic preservationists, uh, the preservation community in the future. From an immediate concern, we're getting to the point where mid-century modern and 20th century architecture is now under threat for redevelopment or is being torn down. Looking at the 20th century and later 20th century architecture is something that we as professionals need to be doing. As a community of preservationists, we need to continue to train practitioners, skilled trades labor. It is one of our biggest preservation concerns as well as community concerns. We need more skilled labor to do these projects, whether it is a preservation project or whether it's just regular construction. I think we've seen through the cost of new construction and other things that we must invest in our existing structures. Uh, it's both a sustainable and economically and financially uh, savvy way of addressing a big problem. So keeping that in the mind of individual people going forward is critical. My dream for the future of South Bend would really be to see not only our historic properties reused in ways that really highlight the great architecture that built the city, but also to look at ways to infill a lot of those spaces that are vacant now where buildings used to stand, to really in, in some ways bring back the vibrancy that uh, we all know existed in South Bend and in our neighborhoods surrounding downtown. That infill process is probably the most important role that we play as city planners and more broadly uh, our community and how we see ourselves moving into the future. There's been many decades of what people might have seen as the city in decline. And I'd like to think that some of those perceptions of the city have begun to change over the last 10 years. And uh, we're really seeing a lot more reinvestment in South Bend, in downtown, in our surrounding neighborhoods. And I really just want people to see South Bend as a place where there's an enormous amount of potential we want to see people move here and we welcome people to our community and hope that they can take part in uh, rebuilding our town but also seeing it grow and uh, develop into a city that we're all already proud of but want to share that with the rest of the country. While we look to the future with the new construction in South Bend, we must continue to actively work to serve the past. There are several large buildings that are still sound, but remain vacant. Some are listed as endangered, and a few are probably doomed, too far gone, or needing too much repair to keep. Sadly, at one time these were the pride of their builders, who made a quality product they assumed would be around for a long time. As always, the fight continues to find new uses and purposes for these outstanding remnants of the 19th century. Development of the city's parks and walking trails has been a priority in recent years. New paths to explore now extend for miles along the banks of the St. Joseph River. These will need upkeep as time goes by. Our newest apartment buildings, some of the largest ever constructed in the city, are home to a growing population. They will bring new challenges to future preservationists as they will have to learn new skills and techniques to deal with the materials of today. How well will modern construction survive? Some materials have proven to be excellent replacements for those used in the past, but many more remain untested by time. Will future generations care about what we build today? Will the skills needed to care and maintain what we have now be passed on? Awareness, education, training, and appreciation will always be required. A well-planned, comfortable, and beautiful environment is something anyone would want. We must always strive to do our best work, then spend our lives enjoying it, and leave it to the next generation to cherish. We know that South Bend is growing now, but uh, we, we want this to continue and accelerate over the coming decades. And so we really do reach world fame status once again. 
And we also have the opportunity to bring our people together and show how do you have a community where everyone can truly thrive. And so uh, this is what we're working on each and every day, and we're proud of where we are, but know we have a lot of work left to do. All throughout South Bend are the remnants that tell the story of its past. Some are hardly noticed in the hurry of everyday life. Old cornerstones can be found, proudly placed by those who built the city, marking in time our growth and progress over the years. Look around as you walk the old familiar streets of South Bend. Details of the city in other days gone by still exist. You might drive down these streets every day but a lot more can be seen if you just slow down and really look at the details. On many of the oldest buildings, you might look up and see a painted sign on the side. Many refer to the name of a former occupant or owner of the property. Some are almost illegible, and although they've weathered many a season, they will soon disappear. Some markers in time are obvious, like the various statues placed throughout the city. One of the best is the 1903 Civil War Memorial on the grounds of the 1898 courthouse, placed in honor of those lost far from home in the defense of the Union. A nice place to visit is the Oliver Mansion and its grounds on West Washington. Very well maintained, they are a time capsule of how one of South Bend's wealthiest families lived over 100 years ago. The Michigan Street Bridge was, and is, the grand entrance into downtown. It had served faithfully since the days of horse-drawn vehicles and Model Ts. Lieber Park, at the foot of the bridge, covers a large area. On the east side is the island, with its canal separating it from the bank and connected by a footbridge. This scene hasn't changed in generations. The west side has gone through several stages, the duck pond, removed in 2018, has been replaced by the restored Studebaker Fountain. An old, unused rail line still exists as a walking and biking trail. A visit to South Bend's city cemetery provides a real connection to the past. So many of the names important to our city's history can be found there. Dating back to 1832, it is now surrounded by urban development. It is over 20 acres and is typical in layout and landscaping of the 19th century. It also contains a few artifacts of interest. An isolated bridge indicates where a failed canal project once was. Surprisingly, not many people know of the cemetery and how close it is to downtown. One of its historic sites is the newly restored burial site of John Auden the first soldier killed in the Civil War from St. Joseph County. In other parts of town, there are blocks of stores that still exist practically unchanged in 75 years, but are mostly vacant, like the stretch on West Western. Other shopping areas, like Miami Street, somehow always seem busy, as various outlets and owners come and go, but it always looks the same. South Bend's west side has some of the oldest neighborhoods left, many unchanged since the 1920s. The modest but still cared for homes and a scattering of shops, small apartment buildings, and a few commercial structures are typical of the American working class environment of the period. We are fortunate to have miles of old brick streets. They last for years and never need paving. Step into the 1890s on West Washington Street. A walk down the cool, shaded street on a summer day is an experience anyone can enjoy. Virtually every house on both sides of Washington are examples of preservation at its finest. This was one of South Bend's first designated historic neighborhoods. On Cottage Grove, one can see the successful results of over 30 years of efforts to bring back a once deteriorated part of town. North Shore Drive is a glimpse of South Bend of 1905, the year almost all the homes seen here were built. 
There are several styles of architecture represented. All are first class examples of home building of the period. 100 years ago, Piashwe was being developed. These homes perfectly capture the spirit of South Bend in the 1920s. They present a comfortable and confident statement of a city on a rapid rise. You can visit South Bend of the 1960s. It's all there in a the drive down York Road. These are the neighborhoods that will, hopefully and change, be survivors into the next century, the designated historic sites for the preservationists of the future. Pierre Navarre's cabin still stands in Leaper Park. It and all the exceptional buildings in South Bend that have survived are emblems of the past. They can be seen, utilized, learned from, remembered, and appreciated. This is the goal and the purpose of historic preservation.